Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. By 1917, Wyoming was the only state in the Rocky Mountain region that was not dry. All of the surrounding states had gone dry by then. Towns like Cody and Evanston and Cheyenne and Newcastle were thriving with drinking tourism. That is, people coming down from Montana or up from Utah or Colorado or in from Nebraska or the Dakotas. On June 30th, 1919, the legal purchase of alcoholic drinks in Wyoming ended. It's legendary in Cheyenne about the big party that occurred and about the only time that the newspapers indicated that there was a bigger party was the night that prohibition was repealed. Other parts of the state prepared for prohibition in other ways. Kemmerer merchants purchased cases of additional liquor, more than a quart for every man, woman, and child. Across Wyoming, mock funerals were held for the passing of John Barleycorn. The morning after the night before, she whizzed, but don't your head feel sore. You when the sun the rose July 1st, 1919, it would be 14 long years before Wyoming's residents could legally buy a drink of alcohol. The new law didn't stop the state's residents from drinking, but it did bring changes. Wyoming created its first statewide law enforcement agency. Hundreds were arrested and fined. Bribes greased the palms of county officials. And politicians who tried to stop the corruption lost elections. Many of the state's citizens circumvented the law. When local law officials looked the other way, the feds stepped in. From its earliest days, life on the Wyoming frontier went hand in hand with alcohol. The temperance movement had been active in Wyoming since its territorial days, but with little effect. By the time the 20th century arrived, temperance organizations had grown across the state. In 1915, Wyoming's Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union presented 10,000 signatures to the state legislature. They wanted the issue of prohibition put to a vote of the people. The legislature took no action. The surrounding states had all gone dry, and Wyoming had become the one wet spot in the Rocky Mountain region. Political pressure increased on the state's leaders. Governor Kerry believed that education could solve the problems associated with alcohol. But reports from the state penitentiary led him to review his position. Several of the staff reports came back and said that many of the, of the inmates in the various correctional facilities in Wyoming were there largely because of abuse of alcohol. So he concluded that maybe there was something that the state could do. And that's also true of John B. Kendrick, who served as governor right after Kerry. And he too had this same change of attitude. Governor Kendrick recommended to the legislature that the issue go before the people for a vote. In 1918, the uh, citizens of Wyoming were allowed to vote on whether Wyoming should go dry or not. And at that point, they voted more than three to one that Wyoming should go dry. Every county in the state said, yes, we should go dry. There's some very interesting speculation as to why that might have occurred, because the election in which prohibition passed occurred just a week or two before the armistice. But in Wyoming, it was interesting because many of the soldiers were gone. So there were all of these men gone from the state. And the question is, well, had those people been voting, might the result have been a little different? Oh, 
Wyoming's vote was part of a national trend. By January 1919, 38 states had adopted the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Congress ratified the new prohibition law and set it to start the following year. When the Wyoming legislature met that January, it wasted no time. It passed a law prohibiting the purchase or manufacture of alcohol effective July 1, 1919, six months before the national law would commence. During Prohibition, you say, well, you can't have any alcohol. It made people, I think, want it more <laughs> because they were told they couldn't do it, especially out west where you have that independent spirit. In late July, 42 men and women were arrested in a Cheyenne raid. The era of Prohibition in Wyoming had begun. Salt Creek oil field was one of the largest in the world and the standard refinery was the largest in the country at that time. So it brought in a huge influx of, of workers, not only in the oil field but also at the refinery. So there were a lot of single men around and, and Casper really became, and there were refineries here, there were really active oil fields at the north end of Natrona County and also many closer to here. So there was an ongoing oil boom as well as all the ranching around, sheep ranching especially. So it was a pretty male place and Casper really became prostitution central for the northern Rocky Mountains. And then as soon as Prohibition came, all those cribs and bars and saloons and cafes were selling liquor too. And you know, the sheriff and the town government, it's not that nobody, it's not that they didn't know what was going on. And there's a judge, Blake Kennedy, he was a federal judge in Cheyenne that actually stated that the Sandbar District was the worst in Wyoming, if not the whole country. It definitely was very notorious and it had made a name for itself very quickly. It's interesting that there are these, these various areas of Wyoming that you can identify as being very much in favor of prohibition and very much in favor of temperance and other areas where it was never popular. From the very beginning, the local populace just, just did not go along with the idea of prohibition. It just made it a little bit more challenging with prohibition that they couldn't do it as openly in the streets. They couldn't sell the alcohol as openly. So the people would just get a little bit more creative. They'd be selling liquor out of the back alleys. Women would hide alcohol on flasks on their hips or in their bloomers or someplace like that so they could transport it a lot easier and more discreetly. The Casper Police Department and the Natrona County Sheriff knew where liquor was being purchased or produced. They did a lot of raids and they would publish a lot of times when they raided either a crib or a bootlegger, they would publish the names in the paper, which for the prostitutes actually gave them more business <laughs> because then people would know who they were and where to find them. A lot of the law enforcement were very corrupt, um, taking bribes from some of the bootleggers to avoid arrest, that kind of a thing. That government corruption was in the news all through um, the decade, and it wasn't just local police. Before Prohibition, law enforcement in Wyoming was very much based on local communities and counties, and the county sheriff pretty much decided what laws would get enforced and which ones wouldn't. Wyoming had created the Department of Law Enforcement, with its sole purpose being the enforcement of the Prohibition laws. It soon became clear that local variations in enforcement were creating problems across the state. Prohibition enforcement had strong support in the farming counties of Goshen, Platte, and Bighorn, while Lincoln, Sweetwater, Natrona, Hot Springs, and Sheridan counties, for the most part, ignored prohibition. One way that you can sort of distinguish those counties from many of the other Wyoming counties is that in those areas there were a good deal of working people, working in mines, working in the oil industry, working in what was at that time very hazardous occupations. And many of these individuals had originated as European immigrants and they obviously had brought with them traditions of alcohol from the old country. 
coal mined in Sweetwater County ran the Union Pacific Railroad, and immigrants from Southern Europe mined the coal. There was a huge influx of Southern Europeans in the 1920s. That would have been during Prohibition. But they brought with them their winemaking skills, and wine was a part of their daily life. And they probably brought with them their moonshine making skills, which wasn't considered moonshine in Europe. I mean, it was probably legal. And so here they come, and they come to a place where liquor cannot be manufactured. They were not the kind of grapes that you make jelly out of. They were wine grapes. They used to sell them by the ton. So a person had to buy a ton of grapes to make, to make wine, at least a ton. Well, I worked for the Rock Springs Wholesale for a man by the name of Barney DeCora. They used to order the grapes by the car loads, and they used to come in by railroad at night. And we used to order how many, whatever tonnage of grapes they wanted, or how many the family could handle, and then they came and got their grapes and took them home in their trucks or whatever. And we, it was about two o'clock in the morning when we always unloaded. They had a little spur they brought in on the lines, and then they came and loaded up their grapes and went home. My husband and I, we bought a bunch of, gra a bunch of grapes for one year, and we used to have bachelors around there and they used to wake us up in the middle of the night and come on to buy a bottle of, well, that was wine we were making. They wanted to buy a bottle of wine. So we had it for one year and I said, no more of that, who kept us up all night. <laughs> Everybody in the neighborhood had wine, everybody. We always went to church on Sunday morning and I don't care what the weather was like, we went to church. And it seemed like Sundays we always had company, always. We had wine, we had whiskey, we had beer. And my mother always baked petites of lancete and oh, it seemed like there was always somebody, always company. And there was not any discussion about it. It was just a normal thing because of, of the community and the type of people we had here. In 1921, federal officials led the largest raid west of the Mississippi River in Sweetwater County, Wyoming. 62 people were arrested in Rock Springs, Green River, and Superior. The bars on the Main Street in South Superior, eight of them, before Prohibition, all had bar written on them. During Prohibition, they became pool halls, and after Prohibition, they became bars again. Now, they all stayed alive, and. Uh, thrived evidently during Prohibition. So uh, the story always was they sold liquor before Prohibition, during Prohibition, and after Prohibition and nothing changed. Kemmerer, Wyoming and neighboring Diamondville were coal mining towns, at one time boasting the world's largest open pit coal mine. But in the 1920s, Wyoming experienced a severe depression with bank failures prolonged drought, foreclosures on farms and ranches, and limited work in the underground mines. In the mining towns like Kemmerer and Diamondville, the men struggle to provide for their families. Joe Sebastian told about his dad, who was a mule driver in the mines. Well, like I said, he was working one day a week a lot of times, or two days, and they were starving. So he just came out one day and threw the bucket away said, if I'm going to starve, I might as well starve in the daytime, you know, in the daylight. So that's when he quit that. And uh, so he went in the bootlegging business. All my mother's brothers, there's four of them, they all delivered liquor, most of it was to Salt Lake City country and to Colville, Utah. And they used to say Colville, they used to have to worry about. And, uh, but they, they were all delivered. And, you know, everybody was doing it. The only way we could make a living, half the town, uh, was making moonshines. We had a lot of wine drinkers down my house, and I think we used to sell it for like a dollar a bottle, which is about a quart bottle. And a lot of people used to come to our house. I can name a few names, but I better not. <laughs> Just like milk for us, you know, we'd rather drink milk or water or lemonade or something. My dad, that was his milk. 
Joe Sebastian's father had him deliver moonshine to a boarding house in his neighborhood. Yes, I had this little red wagon, and my dad would fill up a gallon of uh, moonshine, and it was about three blocks away, and I'd put a sack over it and some toys, and just like I was in clothes or something, whatever, I was kind of like playing. And she would put two dollars in the envelope and hand it to me, and she'd take the gallon of whiskey, and she would sell it to her uh, people that were boarding there. Some bootleg liquor was better than others, and Kemmerer Moon was some of the best. It was packaged up and shipped off to all the, the important speakeasies of Chicago and New York and, and elsewhere around the country. It had a reputation for high quality and, uh, and was apparently much sought after in the speakeasies of the Midwest and the East. Local law officials in Kemmerer may have been looking the other way, but the town's activities attracted the attention of federal agents. But there was one revenue man here, Louis Jones, and, uh, and he knew a lot of people that uh, were doing it. And I know, I know it was one time he was in looking at our window at my house, our house, and scared me to death because he thought we were making moonshine, you know, but he never did pick us up. But it uh, was a frightening experience to see that man looking in, you know, and he worked for the Revenue Department. William Ross was elected governor in 1922. He was a Democrat, progressive, dry. When William Bradford Ross took office in 1923, he made a point that he was going to enforce the law on prohibition. And he saw that there was one problem with how prohibition was being enforced in Wyoming, and that was if you bought alcohol, that was not against the law. Only if you uh, produced it and sold it was that illegal. And so he wanted the person who bought it also to be breaking the law. That never happened during his term. However, the legislature had previously passed a law that gave Wyoming's governor the authority to fire county officials who did not enforce prohibition. Governor Ross, William Ross, who succeeded Robert Carey as governor, took it very seriously that the governor ought to have this authority and in fact initiated several cases against county officials. Uh, to remove them for violating their sacred trust as public officials because they were not enforcing the laws of Wyoming. In October 1924, Governor William Ross suddenly died and a special election was called to replace him. Voters overwhelmingly elected his widow as Wyoming and America's first woman governor. When Governor Nellie Taylor Ross took office in January of 1925, she made a point to say that she was going to continue to enforce the prohibition law just like her husband had done when he took office in January of 1923. And she thought it was a danger to organize government if uh, people did not follow that law because then they would probably not follow other laws as well. She even forced the removal of the county sheriff and the county attorney of Hot Springs County, and, uh, and also the county attorney and county sheriff of, of Sheridan County and several commissioners throughout the state, including a couple of county commissioners in Natrona County. In August 1925, Nellie's commissioner of law enforcement department was forced to resign by Nellie. He had been accused of um, being drunk at work, he had been accused of taking bribes. He had been accused of not enforcing the prohibition law. But she made a lot of enemies by doing that. And for her, a woman to stand up and make these firings is just kind of amazing to me that she had this sense of what needed to be done. And up in Park County in Cody, uh, Sheriff William Loomis had been accused of intoxication on duty, of taking confiscated liquor and giving it to prisoners. Governor Ross heard about this and she encouraged the prosecuting attorney in Cody to press charges. And so he did. Governor Ross then went up to Cody, this was April 1925, and she oversaw the hearing of Sheriff uh, William Loomis. 
Many Cody residents had been against prohibition from its beginning. The most outspoken critic, Carolyn Lockhart, owned the local newspaper and used every opportunity to ridicule enforcement of the law. After two years in office, Nellie Taylor Ross was up for re-election. Governor Ross later said that she chose to spend time taking care of the duties of her office and did not campaign enough. Her opponent, Frank Emerson, campaigned hard. Governor Ross lost the race by 1,300 votes. Nellie believed that what uh, happened in Cody with her going up there and, and overseeing that hearing and then making the final decision to remove Sheriff Loomis from office, that hurt her in the 1926 election. And when you look at the, the election results, it probably did to a degree. She became, in uh, her initial election, the first woman to win the governorship. and. Uh, in her subsequent attempt for re-election, she became the first woman to lose re-election to the governorship, of course. And much of it, much of the, of the latter, much of her loss, I think is attributable to the very strident positions that she took on trying to enforce prohibition. In the same election, Millward Simpson made his first run for the legislature. Simpson, who later served as Wyoming's governor and senator, practiced law in Hot Springs County. His son, Pete Simpson, recalled what his dad told him about the election. In 1926, dad ran on a ticket against the Prohibition Amendment, and uh, he got most of his votes out of Jibo, where their miners were. And he always told the story of a huge, powerful man who ran a bar in Jibo. He was crippled, actually, from the waist down, uh, and he sat in a wheelchair, and he would challenge people to hand wrestling or people would have other people challenge him to hand wrestling. And uh, dad went in there and this canny old bartender, bar owner said, I'll stage, a, I'll stage a hand wrestling match with you. And he said, I could beat you 10 ways to Sunday. He said, but I'll, I may throw that battle if we can get people in here to vote against prohibition and vote you into office. And dad succumbed to that chicanery and, and uh, won the fight uh, disreputably and won the election as a result of the vote that came out of Jibo. By the middle 1920s, the, the industry, you might call it the industry of bootlegging, had uh, become so pervasive in certain places that uh, that law enforcement was was either co-opted into uh, into turning a blind eye to it, or in fact getting involved themselves. In its fight against bootleg liquor, Wyoming and America stiffened penalties. Wyoming, late in the decade, passed a law. Uh, mandating a three-year prison term for anyone caught with a still. And then Congress passed something called the 5 and 10 law, which meant five years in federal prison and a $10,000 fine for anyone caught in possession of alcohol. In Wyoming, it was a losing battle, and prohibition agents were regarded with deepening suspicion. Graft reached the highest levels, even the state law enforcement director, appointed by Governor Emerson, was convicted of bribery and sent to federal prison. There was so much public hypocrisy and so much corruption, uh, I think it just dawned on everybody that this just, this just stinks. Everything just sort of stinks. When moonshiners were arrested and brought to court, Wyoming juries did not want to send them to jail. Not guilty verdicts spread across the state. The locals weren't bad. They didn't have no problem with them. It would be the ones that come in, you know, the government, revenue men, we called them. One of the largest busts occurred in Kimmerer, where federal agents destroyed 24,000 gallons of liquor. breaking the barrels in this thin hole and it was dripping through the floor. 
and he was under there with a pan catching, and he caught about 10 gallons of it, they said, and then they went and sold it and bought a bottle of tea Ford. <laughs> Look at that. That's when, uh, I think that's when my dad quit because they were really, the revenues were men were really coming in heavy and thick at that time because they knew camera was, you know, real, everybody making it, you know. And when they caught that Joe Coletti, like I say, that big one that they all know about, and the whiskey running down the gutters and people picking it up with buckets and everything, taking it in to drink, why, <laughs> that's what I heard, you know. And uh, so that's about the time uh, when we quit. In 1933, the Wyoming State Legislature put the issue of prohibition before the voters. Overwhelmingly, by 72%, they called for repeal. Happy days are here again, the skies above us. At midnight on May 19, 1933, the towns filled with celebration and sirens announced that Wyoming citizens could legally purchase 3.2 beer. By December, three quarters of the states had ratified the 21st Amendment, including Wyoming. The era of prohibition and the nation's noble experiment had come to its end. You could get it all over town, and it's almost like Phonograph Jones, one of the colorful characters in Cody, who was asked one time, were you ever, were you alive during prohibition? Of course, Phonograph was, because at the time he was answering this, he was nearly 60. And he said, yes, it was. And, he said, well, what did you think about that phonograph? And he said, well, it was better than no whiskey at all. 